Hello, and welcome to Reimagining the Future of Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning and Legal Services, the second webinar in Penn Carey Law School's Future of the Profession and Initiative Spring Webinar Series on Reimagining the Future of the Legal Profession. I'm Jen Leonard, Executive Director of the Future of the Profession Initiative, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you to today's session. Over the course of our spring series, we'll explore a variety of topics that highlight change in the modern legal profession. We'll explore topics that include the future of the legal work environment, racial equity in the legal profession, legal regulatory reform, and the future of lawyer formation. Today, our discussion will focus on the future of artificial intelligence and machine learning in legal services. We've planned a dynamic and engaging conversation about applications of these advancing technologies in legal services, the challenges to cultural adoption of tech and legal organizations, and some of the concerns new tech raises about biases and ethics. I'll introduce our moderators in just a moment, but first, a few housekeeping items. To submit a question, please use the Q&A feature found on the ribbon at the bottom of the window. The Q&A portion of our program will be facilitated by Penn Law 2L JD MBA student Yawande Alade, beginning at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Please use the controls to upvote any questions you'd like the guest experts to answer, and Yuande will select the most popular questions. Please keep your questions topical and appropriate. Anyone posting inappropriate content will be removed from the webinar. We're excited to feature a new element to our programming, a post-webinar discussion for those of you who, like me, really miss our pre-COVID world when we could discuss the themes that emerge from these great discussions with fellow attendees. These discussions will begin at 4.30 Eastern Standard Time, and we'll share more information about them near the end of our webinar. If you're seeking CLE credit for today's event, please note that the CLE codes will be presented twice per hour. Please write them down and enter them on your digital evaluation form once the event ends. The evaluation form is mandatory to receive CLE credit. Please find the link to the evaluation in the chat. These codes will let us know how long you attended. Attendees must attend the post-webinar breakout discussions from 4.30 to 5.30 Eastern Standard Time to receive two full credits of CLE. And now, here's the first CLE passcode. Are you ready? The passcode is SCIENCE, S-C-I-E-N-C-E. -E. Also, if you're a little bit like me and you lack familiarity with some of the technologies we might discuss today, we've created a handy glossary of terms for your convenience. We're dropping a link to that resource in the chat now, so please feel free to click on it and peruse the terms as you listen to the chat. And now, without further ado, I'll invite our moderators, Jonathan Petz and Miguel Willis to join the discussion. Jonathan and Miguel will guide our conversation today and we'll introduce our guest experts in a moment, but both Jonathan and Miguel have specific expertise in this area and we'd love to share a little bit about their backgrounds with you before we get the conversation started. So I'll ask each of you just to share a bit about uh, your work in the legal profession and how it intersects with the topics that we'll explore today before we welcome our guest experts. And going in alphabetical order, I'm going to start with one of our own alums, Jonathan Petz, uh, Penn Law class of 2007, before moving over to FPI's inaugural innovator in residence, Miguel Willis. Jonathan, could you tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jen. Um, <clears throat> my name is Jonathan Petz. I um, for about the last six years, I've been working at the intersection of access to justice and technology, um, and I've co-founded two online legal aid organizations. The first is called uh, Upsolve, and it is basically a TurboTax for Chapter 7 bankruptcy that's helped over 5,000 low-income American families erase about uh, $300 billion million in debt. Not billion yet. Um, and the second one is... Um, a online legal aid agency for low-income immigrants and dreamers called immigrationhelp.org. Excellent, I like that yet. Uh, <laughs> definitely get there someday. Uh, thank you so much, Jonathan. And also I'd like to hear from our innovator in residence, Miguel Willis. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Miguel Willis, uh, as Jim mentioned. Uh, FPI Innovator in Residence, and also the founder and executive director of the Access to Justice Tech Fellows Program. Uh, the Tech Fellows Program uh, catalyzes, engages law students to, to work in technology projects at courts, legal aids, uh, legal tech companies, uh, and organizations like Upsolve. 
Many of our, our fellows have developed AI tools for the law. We'll, we'll learn much more about that uh, in the webinar. So really happy to engage in this conversation. Well, thanks to you both. And you can learn more about our moderators and our panelists' extensive backgrounds by visiting our event splash page at futureoftheLegalProfession.org. And with that, I am going to take off and turn it over to Jonathan and Miguel to welcome our guest experts. Thanks to you both. Well, we got an exciting panel today. I'm, I'm happy to uh, introduce our panelists. Also very happy to be co-moderating this thing alongside Jonathan Patch. Jonathan's a really cool guy. Uh, so yeah, let's have some fun today. Um, our first panelist for today is no other, and we're gonna do this different. We're not gonna read off bios. We're going to, I'm gonna introduce them. They're gonna tell uh, about themselves and the work that they're engaging in. Um, our first panelist, um, Nadeep Martin, uh, she's the director of product, of project, uh, product management at uh, Primer AI. Next panelist, we have Christopher Grant. He's the law tech director at Bar Barclays Ventures. And finally, last but not least, Ivy Ashton, the president and founder of Legal Server. So welcome you all. Um, and if you don't mind sharing a little bit about yourselves, the type of work that you do, um, yeah, and hope what you hope to kind of engage and share uh, during this discussion. So I'll start, start it off with you, Nadeep. Sure thing. Nice to meet you guys. I'm Nadeep Martin. Um, I am probably the, the one non-attorney in this group. <laughs> um, I started my career as an engineer. I went over to product management and have spent the last 10 years or so applying machine learning, nat natural language processing to solve real business problems at B2B and B2C companies. Um, at Primer, um, we're a startup that analyzes documents to help analysts understand the world around them. Um, starting right off, our CEO recognized that there's a sea of information, um, whether that's the millions of news documents that come out in a single day, uh, to scientific research, or even just data that resides within a corporation. Um, and so our mission is to create tools um, behind the decisions that change the world. Um, and so our verticals are um, around media, uh, finance, uh, retail, public affairs and national security. And prior to Primer, I led machine learning initiatives at both Comcast and the Washington Post working on their personalization strategy. Very excited to, to be here today and, and help you guys think about other non-attorney non uh, legal uh, sides of the case as far as use cases. Thank you. Chris? Sure, um, thank you very much for having me. I'm really delighted to be here because I think it's a super interesting conversation. Um, I started life in private practice, so working at Freshfields um, over here in London before moving to work in-house within an investment bank, which is where I kind of stopped doing any legal work and um, got more involved in the operations side of things. So how to run a legal function. Um, so taking on COO roles within the bank, which ultimately is all focused on how to reduce costs, bring efficiencies to the way that we work, which has long Long story short, led me into the world of law tech because, of course, that's helping to drive lots of efficiencies in the way that we are working. Um, so most recently, I've actually been working in um, the Barclays Eagle Lab, which we've got. Uh, it's an incubator, uh, which is based in London and focused on law tech. We have many more areas that we focus on, but the Notting Hill Gate Lab was the first one where we really started to look at the technologies that could help support change within the, the legal industry. And um, I've got really have a really unique position where I get to see some really great things that are happening um, and really keen to share some of those with uh, with the group that we've got today. Thank you. Ivy? Great. My name is Ivy Ashton. Uh, I'm an attorney based in Chicago. Uh, I'm the founder of a company called Legal Server. Uh, we work with nonprofit civil legal aid organizations and public defenders throughout the United States to build technology to help them get leverage so that they can help more people, uh, people that typically cannot afford a lawyer. So we, we kind of work with organizations that have the opposite problem that most law firms have. Uh, legal aid groups or public defenders have unlimited demand and very limited supply. And so they use technology tools to help them get leverage so that they can do more work more effectively and more efficiently. 
we build those tools. Thank you. Uh, well, as Jen mentioned, uh, we provided a kind of glossary of, of the different terms that we'll probably be covering and throwing out today, machine learning, AI, natural language processing. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna kick it over to uh, Jonathan and you know, really have a start off with a discussion around the hype around AI and the law. Yeah, there is so much hype around legal tech these days. Raise your hands out there if you've heard the word robo lawyer one or more times in the last two or three years. Um, you know, I, I think this idea of, of, of robo lawyers coming to, to automate our profession, you'll, you know, enter in, in layman's language, uh, a legal problem you're having or just a fact pattern, and then the computer will spit back through the magic of, of AI the, the solution and case law supporting it and the brief to just you know, drop off in court, um, wouldn't that be amazing? Um, but it's interesting, the companies that have been, you know, promoting themselves as robo-lawyers, you know, now are, are basically either out of business or are not, um, have pivoted just away from legal. So there are um, some, this is really hard work um, to, um, to do, to, to, to introduce um, artificial intelligence into the law. And Chris, um, you know, you are um, running legal ops, legal technology at Barclays, one of the biggest international banks um, out there. Um, I'd love to hear from you, like getting past the hype, what are the actual use cases where AI is actually saving Barclays money, making Barclays money, or reducing risk for Barclays, like today? So, so look, I should probably put a little caveat in at the beginning of all of this in that um, it's still really early days for AI and the use of that. So um, it, it, it's hard to talk about where the big, big wins are yet because we just don't know in many respects. But I can talk to a couple of examples as where as to where AI can help us um, and, and where, where the direction of travel that we're kind of taking at the moment and putting it into very real terms for, for legal. Um, I mean, we are always looking at new technologies and new ways of doing things and AI therefore has become a, a real interest point and how that is being used. Um, two examples really. First, in, in if we think about um, contracts and contract negotiation, um, being able to use AI allows you to speed up that whole negotiation process. If we're starting to drill into each of the clauses that are sitting within the documents that you have, or even uh, you think of the number of different types of a very similar contract that are existing out there, um, you can have AI go in and start to learn from the way that we're negotiating, what we're negotiating and what is being put into each of those clauses. So we get to a position where real time you're working on a document you're working through negotiation and suggestions are already being put in front of you we're not taking the lawyer out of the process it's giving the lawyer more information so that they're able to make far more informed decisions without having to do all the background work to make those informed decisions because that information is coming to you so that's one very real example of, of where we're going and there's challenges to all of that because one thing that AI needs is data. And I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about that later. I won't take us down that rabbit warren now. Um, but the more information it has, the better those algorithms start to work against that data. So that's, that's one thing to think about. The second kind of very real example of where we could start to use AI and where it is being worked on at the moment is around court data. And how can we use it to start to predict the outcome of cases or even start to look at where you might want to, you know, even you think about judges, which judge do you want to go in front of? Because ultimately, if we're starting to look at historical court data and starting to make predictions, we could very much say, actually, you don't want to have your case that afternoon with that judge because they're normally quite full and a little bit tired. You know, it's, it's that type of thing. So um, that's where it's exciting. And that's two very real cases of where there is tremendous amount of work going on at the moment to, to bring AI to the fore and where it could really start to align with the legal industry. Very cool. Um, IV, you know, I think in, in my opinion, as, as big as the need for automation and, and artificial intelligence is in, in corporate legal, in the access to justice space and legal aid, it's, just, it's even more because there's just never going to be enough free lawyers out there. So, you know, if your role as president of legal server, which is basically the case management system that most legal aid agencies in the country are using, um, what are you seeing like today 
um, where, where AI is actually being used effectively to, to bridge the, the justice gap. Yeah, thank you, <clears throat> Jonathan. I, you know, when, when I have conversations about artificial intelligence, I like just to kind of introduce it by saying, let's replace the word AI with just technology. And let's set up the proposition that we use tools like technology to help us get leverage. And with leverage, we can do more. So if I were a law firm and I were trying to take the assets we own, which are typically people, um, and you wanna, and you're billing by the hour, you would, you would try to leverage to get more uh, production out of the people so that you could increase, you know, ultimately profit and revenue and all of that. Um, in the legal aid context or in the, in the nonprofit context or when someone can't afford a lawyer, we're using technology to, to really um, get leverage to create uh, desired outcomes or um, impact. And it really stems from the idea that if, if a person or if our, our legal system doesn't work unless it works for everybody, and one of the barriers to it working for everybody is you tend to need a lawyer. Um, so that's usually how I set this conversation up. So when, when we look at the tools um, in terms of how we can help people, we look at things like where do people intersect with, that have problems intersect with the lawyers? And it used to be that you had to meet in person with a lawyer. So you had to come into an office and sit down and talk. But now there are numerous communication channels because of technology. And, and you know, again, we don't think of this stuff as AI typically, we just think about it as like, what are the communication channels? Email, the web, um, and now there are a bunch of messaging applications. So the, a shift that has happened in technology is a shift towards like a conversational interface, an interface where you interact through language um, with something and to get a desired outcome. So if we can build tools that can live in different channels, we can engage clients 24 hours a day, seven days a week when they need help. Um, it can be asynchronous or it can be real time, meaning that they can come to it and, and provide some information and expect a result later. Email is a good example of asynchronous communication, or it can be real time. Like I, I wanna be able to chat with somebody or chat with something to get some information. So the types of tools that we see are types uh, that kind of fall under this category within natural language processing called natural language understanding. And natural language understanding is a term that describes how within the context of language, what does something mean? So if somebody presents a legal issue by describing it, as opposed to coming and saying like, I have an eviction case, they just say, you know, the person I pay my rent to told me I had to move out. Right. Well, we as lawyers interpret that and say, oh, you're being evicted. And then we start asking questions or whatever. So now with enough data and with different, um, different uh, approaches or strategies, we can build tools that can take that language and figure out what they're describing such that we can engage in conversations without having to have humans do the, the um, bulk of the, the speaking, if you will. That's an example of how we're leveraging yeah. it. A second example, just real quickly, is that another challenge when a case presents is how likely are we going to be able to get the impact in this case that we want enough so that we want to dedicate our limited resources to this particular case. And so AI is an, another way I describe it is it's prediction. I and mean, that's at a core what AI is. At the core, it's math. It's predicting something. Um, that's what analy analytics helps predict um, the likelihood of something happening. So like we wanna know things when a case presents based on the level of service that we're going to give this client, based on the legal issues that this client has and some other factors, how many days should we expect this case to be open within our agency? How many hours should we expect to have to dedicate to this? And then we can you know, infer from that cost and whether or not this is the best use of our limited resources. Those are kind of a couple of examples. That's fascinating, especially um, that last piece of, of keeping cases open. How long, you know, how much resources can we, as a legal aid organization with very finite resources and then to using data, um, that's really powerful. Um, so, you know, we've talked about the, the current use cases. Um, I'd love to hear, I've often heard it said that humans underestimate what tech can do in two years and really underestimate what it can do in 10 years. Um, so 
Now, deep, you know, you are sitting some this sort of rarefied perch. You're actually an engineer. You actually build products. Um, where do you see this industry being um, changed in, in the next, you know, a decade from now? Yeah, I think that on the natural language understanding point, I think that it's, it's just going to get better. Um, so across- Can you clarify that just, just for, for our audience, could you clarify kind of what natural language processing is or what that means? Yeah, yeah, sure. So it's the idea of taking unstructured text. So that could be an email, it could be a news you know, document, it could be any do document, right, a PDF. Um, an image even, right? So any document and, uh, sorry, forget that, that I said image, we're talking about natural language processing, <laughs> um, but any text document. And the, the idea there is, is natural language processing is the, the concept of taking that document using um, our study of words to understand what, what, is, what is in that document. So for, for example, I could take um, a, a news article that came out today, um, something our, our company in fact does is we extract out the relevant people, the relevant organizations, locations. So any entity can be extracted using a, a, a model to train against that. Um, but taking that further, I can summarize that, that information um, using um, techniques such as there, there's different ways. There's extractive where I'm literally picking and choosing the sentences from the originating document. So there's no words that are not in that originated do document. Um, there's another form of that, which is abstractive summarization, where you're summarizing the concepts using your own words. And then there's a mixture one where you, you, you only use words that are in the document, but you're still coming up with your own. Um, so when we say natural language understanding, it's the, the ability to break down not just one document, right? You're probably, in, you know, where AI comes to play is, is millions of documents where a human being can't possibly read through them all. Um, AI is then providing structure so that I can say, search against that. Tell me everything you know about this organization, about this person. Um, tell me about case history that's evolved over time. You can actually, um, and some things we've done on the, the new side is like, tell me, um, I, I want to understand the conflict with the South China Sea. Help me understand that over time. And you can actually take that and under cluster information together so that you can make sense as a human being and understand how something might have transpired. Interesting. So Chris, how do you see this um, playing out in the corporate legal space 10 years from now? Uh, look, I think it's it's going to be interesting uh, as to where we go and how it takes on from now. And as you've heard Nabdu just talking through some of the potential uses of them, and already we'll be seeing it in e-discovery and you know, the the turn and churn of those documents. And um, I mean, I don't know what the paralegals are going to be doing anymore. We're going to have to focus them on some other stuff quite quickly. But you know, you can see already that there's real potential in there to make quite a significant change to the way that we operate and the way that we do things. There's huge challenges around all of that, and there's lots of things that we need to think through and there's lots of concerns that we as lawyers will have as to taking those kind of approaches so I think there's plenty that we've got to think about but we need to kind of jump on this bandwagon because um, it's super interesting as to what the potential use cases are and where we can start to use it and we're barely scraping the surface of it if I think from um, our own internal function and I think about it from the bank perspective you know heavily regulated there's lots of risks sitting across the organization what can we do with AI to help us to identify that and avoid the risk from actually coming true um, that's where the real interesting piece comes and it'll be similar with IV as well as to you know any kind of it's not just protecting the bank and protecting what we're doing but completely anybody that's out there that is at risk of running into a potential legal difficulty we've got the potential to solve it or at least point that out before they they fall into the trap so can you can you drill down in like specific examples like how is um ai going to prevent bark with getting a suit <laughs> Um, I think if I if I had that one, I'd have a very different job at Barclays. Um, if I had the answer to that <laughs> one there. Um, I mean, look, ultimately, it, it, it is being able to identify the problem before it comes. It's not going to necessarily help us with um, dealing with the problems after it's happened. I mean, it will help us move through litigation far quicker um, and we'll be able to, to deal with the litigation far quicker. But that's not stopped us from getting sued. That's us dealing with it post the point. Right. The real bit is being able to, to watch what is happening. And, be, and you know, there's a little a big brother in here, but let's be real, big brother's already watching a lot of what we're doing at the moment. So we shouldn't necessarily be, be scared of it. Um, it. It is much more about the protection side of things and how can we actively manage our risk as opposed to dealing with the, the impact of the risk 
arising or uh, having come true. Awesome. Okay. And, and IV, you know, the access to justice space, how are we going to close the access to justice gap? How are we going to make meaningful progress on it 10 years from now with AI? Is it going to happen at all? It'll for sure happen. Um, and ironically, some of the innovation may actually come from the access to justice community because there the pressures are so different than they are in the law firms. Yeah. And, you know, what we're already seeing is a shift from thinking about what lawyers do as a service. You know, oftentimes we describe what lawyers do as like we provide services. Um, we're now starting to think of it in terms of legal product. Like, how do we create a product where the product instead of the people or a combination of products and people provide the value? And so really at the end of the day, what we end up with, and, you know, I'll speculate 10 years out, is, uh, you know, think of a lawyer, the tools that are available to a lawyer. And I, and I want to emphasize, I think Chris said this earlier, but I want to say this, this isn't to replace the lawyer. So you said something about robo-lawyer. It's just to give the lawyers different tools. And so we can think of lawyers as a conductor in a symphony, because we're going to have a symphony of technologies working together that are going to be solving problems that provide value to our clients. And um, there are three kind of distinct areas that I think might, um, might you know, be driving and, you know, in 10 years might be relevant. One is around natural language generation. So this is kind of a third discipline within natural language processing um, there's the, you know, the processing of language, there's the understanding of language, and then the generation of language. Can we generate sentences? Can we generate briefs based on things that we know that in terms of how lawyers respond to those things? And certainly the answer is yes. A lot of sports articles today initially are written by computers. So like when at the end of a football game online, there's an article about um, the game itself a computer has generated that based on the box score of the game, just as an example. People may not know that. Um, so I think the discipline of natural language generation. I think the second one is around um, uh, legal argument or being able to generate arguments, take sides to debate, and have uh, the machines understand the, the different sides of the coin and what one side's arguing, what the other side is going to argue and kind of come up with and structure the argument for the lawyer to help them prepare um, in that. And then the third one is some combination of artificial intelligence working with augmented reality or mixed reality. This is the, this is the idea that we're wearing some type of lens, a contact lens, glasses or something where we're seeing information as we're talking to something. So my prediction is in 10 years, a lawyer is cross-examining somebody on the stand and in their glasses, they're, they're seeing information about what question to ask next, when to push, because based on how fast computers can process information and understand things, if somebody makes a claim on the stand, it is, in, it is likely in my mind that we'll be able to get information back by searching and saying, wait, wait, you said something totally opposite of that over here. And I want to, I'm going to impeach you with this thing that you, you've done. That's all possible because of artificial intelligence. And again, that's why I say like the, the symphony of technologies all working together could be, um, there's, there's something called sentient analysis or like, how do we know when somebody's lying? Like the micro movements in their muscles in their face can be predicted with video. So like, as we're talking to somebody in the sand, AI may say they're lying, they're nervous, they're, you know, uh, and that might give us some insight. So these types of things I think all work together. Is that too far out there? <laughs> That's awesome. I, I hope I'm never a witness of this. this I know, right? That's terrifying. Uh, I think it's super exciting, but it means, really, <laughs> uh, you know, the, 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 the essence in there is it, it frees, you know, Lawyers are terrified. We've talked about the robot lawyer and all of this. There's this big fear that, that AI is going to come in and take over the world. Skynet will go live and Terminator is going to arrive. Um, what this is ultimately going to give us the ability to do, and where I get excited, where I wish it had been there all those years ago, is you can then focus on the really interesting strategic advice that you need to give, the, the fun work that we like doing. Um, 
and just be able to get to those points far quicker um, than we have been up until now and have far more information at our fingertips um, than we than we ever have done before to make much more reason, much more informed discussions. And, and, you know, negotiations will still be as exciting as ever they were before um, and actually even more exciting because there's more information to hand. Um, but it, yeah, it is. It, it's going to free us up to do the stuff that we all got into law for in the first place. Yeah, that does sound like a more fun way to practice law for sure. And I mean, that brings to, to the next question, which is like, what are the obstacles to this, this 10 years from now actually happening? Um, you know, now Deep, you, you were, you know, immersed in the tech. I'd love to hear your take. Chris, you've seen uh, many uh, legal tech startups come and, and presumably fail, like, you know, startups do. Um, and Ivy, you are, you know, you're working in this space. So, um, you know, all three of you, I'd, I'd love to hear like, what's, what has to change? What are, what, what are the obstacles? I, I can definitely start us off. I would say easy access to data, right? This, this all is, it's, it's like fuel, right? It doesn't matter if you have the most, the fanciest car on the block, unless you have that fuel and, and data here is, is that fuel. Um, so whether it's easy access to case data um, that anyone can access, like the, talking about on the, the public side, making this more accessible, like that is, is needed to understand. So that's say, I have an issue with, um, you know, a landlord that I, I can easily look that up, right? And and that it's not something that I need. So I I, I think that's number one. Um, number two, what are the hindrances? Is I, I would say trusted data. So in this, it's in the the example that um, that Ivy just gave, like oh maybe where you, you could be in a courtroom and you have that data kind of playing out um, in some sort of virtual reality headset. What about not going to the court in the first place, right? So, so what if, where can we actually, with the access to data, understand all of the, say, public statements somebody might have made, all of the emails like that that are easily, you know, uh, brought brought out using AI, right? So if I if I'm trying to study a case on fraud and I have, and this is very much done, right, even today on the on in other industries, I can develop a classifier that knows what fraud is and that can read through all of the PDFs, emails everything in your system to understand, hey, hey, this is about fraud and, and, and then taking that forward. Um, so do we, do we trust that data? Like, do, do you actually need to, to, to have that kind of take place in, in a courtroom or can you actually maybe stop that, you know, and have something in between, I suppose, and, and have that happen? So those are, those are my two, two takes on it, I'd say. Thank you, Chris. Um, surely, I, I, I totally agree with, with those apps and that data one is is a, a massive challenge. Um, like we've said, you need data to be able to train the algorithms to do what we need to do to be able to make this move forward. And um, within legal and legal information, it's all confidentiality. We've got cybersecurity problems that we need to deal with. We've got clients that have got controls that they and ultimately they how much information does a law firm own versus is owned by their clients who they are working for um, and particularly if you're working with somebody like a Barclays in the financial services industry um, regulation also layers another complexity into being able to release that data and um, not to be said that it can't be overcome there's plenty of people that are thinking about how to overcome that issue and actually bringing technology to the fore to help us do that so allowing you to drop algorithms behind the security walls where this data sits and then give you back the results of that algorithm without you ever having even seen that um, that information being done. So that's being chipped away at. Uh, but there is also a big problem in terms of um, you know, legal is an industry that's been doing things the way we have for an awful long time. We've been very happy with Microsoft Word and we thoroughly enjoyed having Clippy in there to help us um, do things that we needed to do. We don't, you know, um, so so it's, it's hard for us to step outside of that comfort zone and and start to try things new. So there is a mindset shift that needs to happen and it is happening. And I think COVID has certainly ha helped with that journey because we've all had to find new ways of working now. Um, and we're much more familiar with technology than we used to be. Um, there is a difficulty within the, the people that we want to have using it. So if I think about it from an in-house perspective, um, to be able to use technology, we absolutely want to, but um, we've got huge costs because we're <laughs> spending lots of money with our law firms as well as supporting a very big internal team. Um, there isn't much left to invest in technology. And if we go to the bank to ask for more, um, they're kind of like, well, you're already spending a fortune um, on managing our litigation and everything else that we're doing. So it's, it's, it, it has to be a pretty 
big business case to be able to secure that. So we often look to our law firms um, to help us with all of that. Um, and that puts a law firm in a position where they've got multiple clients all putting demands on them for slightly different things. It just doesn't work as effectively as, as it could do. And I think we need to go through a bit of a process of collaborating a little bit more, talking a little bit more um, and trying to refine the problems and be clear around what the problems are that we want to try and solve by using technology. Because there are startups aplenty that are coming up with some amazing ideas and really thinking about how they can deploy the technologies that are at their fingertips and use it in the legal profession. Um, and quite rightly, as you pointed out, often they do, they do fail, but then they seem to come back <laughs> with another idea and something new <laughs> that's coming through and they've no, buddied up with somebody enough. else that had another great idea. Um, so, you know, th th there's very definitely that data piece in there, but there's also this mindset shift that, that needs to happen within the industry. And we need to start to come together more to help to accelerate the change. Awesome. Ivy, what, what are the obstacles in access to justice legal aid? Well, uh, the biggest obstacle in legal aid is funding. Um, you know, this is, these, these ideas are expensive at their core. Um, and so when you have very limited resources, as Chris was just saying, it's hard to dedicate the resources. I, look, I think in general, we, we can just say as lawyers, we're not very open to change. And I think, you know, we're, we're, we're one of the very few industries where we regulate ourselves um, and the rules that govern how we practice law are, is an obstacle. Um, it doesn't really invite in, in in innovation, um, we're in fact, you know, because of the billable hour, we actually have a disincentive to get really efficient. Um, I, one of my favorite stories uh, was uh, one of my really good friends who graduated law school um, and took a job at a very big law firm in Chicago in 1992, and he. Uh, he was, his job was to carry the briefcase of the managing partner who was one of the best litigators in the country. And he went to court every day and he said his day started at about 4 p.m. when they got back from court and he'd do all the work. And one day the, the partner came in and said, Dave, I need you to find in the stack of depositions, which was about six feet tall, this one word. Knowing that it would take Dave all night until the morning to read all of those depositions to find that one word. And the partner shut the door and Dave turned to the paralegal and said, don't we have these depositions on floppy disk? And the paralegal said, we do. And he hit control F and he found 19 places in those documents where that word existed. And an hour later, he walked into the partner's office and he told them about this magic that he had done this control F and the partner couldn't believe it. He was very excited. But, and, and the funniest part of that story is a week later, the partner went to the other partners and said, oh my God, you're not going to believe of the magic of control F. And the other partners got very angry and said, that cost us $1,800 because we could have billed his time. So I, I tell that story in part because I think it's a really funny story. And it seems also very um, odd that we wouldn't have control F, you know, now, but um, I tell it because like, the pressure on how we make money is based on the billable hour. When we shift to a product and, and we start to think of things that you might subscribe to, so maybe law firms become something that you subscribe to, and the value that we give um, to, as law firms to our clients is a totally different value proposition than we do as just lawyers. So an example of that might be if we represent McDonald's, and we have tens of thousands of leases all over the world where McDonald's has entered into leases. And we can use technology to leverage, as, as Chris was kind of talking about this, as Naveep was talking about, you know, and extract information out of those documents and present it back to the client and say, here's what we know, here's where your risks are, here's your spectrum of information and data that we know, here's price per square foot by zip code, all the different things that. I would never leave that law firm because the value that they would provide me as a client, if I had all of those leases, would be invaluable. I would subscribe to that to have the right to, to that. So, but lawyers don't think in those terms. And so that's, that's a long way of saying that our, we are our worst enemies. <laughs> our obstacle is us. Struggle against the billable hour is real. <laughs> it is, it is. So, so with that, I'm gonna lateral the ball over to Miguel was going to tee up some of the really fascinating ethical issues posed by um, artificial intelligence in the law. 
Yeah, yeah, really great discussion so far. And I, I, Chris, you mentioned trusted data. Nadine you mentioned building good models. Um, so what 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 is the I guess potential bias around um, AI or potential concerns around AI in the law? Um, and you know how. Could you, uh, Nadeep, after, could you explain a little bit of, of more about building models around AI and some of the ethical uh, concerns around that? So, I mean, look, I, I, this is a conversation that I, I often get pulled into and can go on for hours because um, it, it becomes a real favorite topic for many people that can get involved in it. I'd love to see the, the faces of everybody else as we run through some of these things. Um, but, you know, fundamentally, if you think about what we do, within the law, we've got um, lawyers that are sat making decisions or um, taking particular direction or particular stances based on the knowledge that they all have. And all of this is kind of trackable. We know what we're doing. We, it, it ties back to law. We're very clear around what's happened. Um, we know why we have made decision A, which has taken us to decision B, which has taken us to decision C, and therefore we've got this result or we've put this clause into the contract or we're gonna make this claim. Um, suddenly we're putting it's like harry potter <laughs> like it's dark magic that we're starting to put over all of these things and the question then becomes is how do we know um what has informed this and how can we evidence the route that this has taken and you know if we think about it with a true lawyer's hat on um who do we blame if something goes wrong um and that's the bit where we need to be able to explain and understand and be clear around why we've taken that path and i think it's important to remember that the, the decision still ultimately sits with the lawyer at the end of all of this. The, the, the AI is informing us um, and it is starting to present more information. I mean, there's certain elements in there that where, where I wouldn't say it's full decisions in there, but it's taking us down a route, it's a guided route. Um, but the powerful thing is all of that is explainable. You, you're able to identify where the AI has gone. It's not just made it all up as it's gone along. And if at any point we needed to go into it in greater detail, we're able to. But there is that big question. And you know, I, it's only as we start to use it more that we will start to answer it. And it may impact laws and how it's taken forward is you know, that bit of who's to blame if AI's got it wrong, if AI's got it wrong, if AI has in fact been the one that's got it wrong. So how do we dive into that and how do we know? I can kind of bring a, both a different angle as well as um, at, to answer your question, Miguel, how are, how are models even created? Um, I, th I think it helps to kind of think about that and, and where, where people come in and, and why biases can even enter the equation. Um, so let's say like I'm creating a model, um, uh, I'll give you an example. I, I'm a, I'm trying to de make it more efficient to find people to to um, to land people at in my in jobs. So I'm a, it's a job applicant process, and I'm looking at past data. Who are all the applicants that applied to this job? Did I hire them? And I and so I'm developing a model based off of past data. So I have basic. Here's the, this person's resume. Were they hired or not? Yes or no. And, and this is my data. Let's let's say I'm a, a large firm, so I have hundreds of candidates. And so the the goal of this mission that I have is I want when a new resume comes in, I want AI to tell me should I bring this person in for an interview, right? Should I even look at their resume? Um, so as you can imagine, playing that out, let's just say this this particular firm happened to 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 be biased um, and and hired more male or more of you know a specific. Um, you know, ethnic group or, or uh, you know, miss certain ethnic groups. So you now have bad data, right? That you're now training AI to then inform, right? The, the future of decisions. And so it's a, it's a hard problem, right? It's not, um, it's not something you, you may even think to recognize. And, and that's where I, um, there's other examples that, you know, have taken place in other industries um, in the, um, I'll give you a couple, like in the 1960s, 70s, um, General Motors, were, they were creating crash test dummies for the first time. Um, and uh, the, the crash test dummies they created were modeled after themselves, um, a bunch of kind of old uh, men, you know, and, and, um, and what happened, proceeded to happen after is um, there were accidents all over the place involving women and children. Um, another example, um, Microsoft chatbot um, earlier um, was designed to talk like a teen and um, over time and people Microsoft says that there was a coordinated effort by online trolls to to try to um, <laughs> basically uh, screw with this but essentially over time it started um, making racist comments and so so you you go back and and you analyze these situations and 
Um, there's a couple like solutions in my mind that that can like it, it is it, number one is team diversity. If you have people um, that are diverse representing the, these different groups, you're of course just quite naturally going to test for yourself, right? You're going to bring yourself into that equation. Um, and I know that diversity is a huge, huge topic, especially right now. And if you can't get that, if you can't, and, and that needs to be first and foremost, like you really need to have a diverse organization to, to help on this. Um, but if you can't get that, there are other ways. Like there's there's com companies like usertesting.com where they you actually list out the, what, how, who you want to test your product. Um, you can you can then have um, you can get those users. But at the end of the day, you want to introduce that into your processes and and actively think about that to make sure you're not inadvertently. No one intentionally you know designed the Microsoft chatbot right to to behave that way. It's something that it's it's always an oversight or hopefully it's an oversight. And so how do you fix these oversights? Is 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 actually actively thinking about how to make sure that those types of things don't happen. Yeah, yeah, um, we see this playing out in courts uh, today with you know, several pr predictive uh, algorithms uh, around bail and sentencing. Um, so I, I, I want to toss it to you in terms of like, what, what's the court, like, what's the court's responsibility in, ter in terms of like, ensuring that these algorithms, these predictive algorithms aren't harming the communities that they're uh, aiming to, to secure justice for? Yeah, it's that's a it's a good example and a hot button issue. Um, and just to give it a little context, there's a company that created algorithms that tries to predict the um, likelihood of somebody repeating a crime, and they use and they want courts to use that in order to help determine whether or not to give bail, uh, um, or whether or not to issue parole, things like that. The challenge here is like, this is a classic AI problem. Um, the first problem is that the way that the, the model is trained on that is using data, which has come out of humans that are biased. So you, you inherently bring that bias into the data because you're using previous decisions to try to determine the likelihood of something. And there are a lot of different factors that go into why someone may behave something and how predictable is that somebody will do something. So if you're relying solely on this algorithm to decide whether or not to give bail to somebody, that's problematic. It's, it's further problematic because the company that owns the algorithm won't release how the decision is made with inside of the algorithm. So the algorithm is, is a trade secret. They're not about to open that up because they think it'll bring competition. But without it, we have no way of seeing what's inside the black box. Um, you know, there's just this box that we put, you know, we put some inputs in, some processing happens and we get an output and then now we're asked to make a decision on that. So I think courts especially need to be, you know, reject those types of companies. I don't think we can use them. I, and I think we're, we're seeing, and I don't think people realize that this is how courts were, were, were actually using this technology, but they have been. Um, I think now it, with public pressure, people are moving away from that. But I, I just want to say, like, when it comes to the ethics of artificial intelligence, you know, we have seen this movie before. Um, it's now just presenting that the technology is called artificial intelligence. But technology has always changed the world. So like, if you look at what happened in the 1800s with the invention of the steam engine or the invention of the tools that change how farming is done, it moved people, it moved people that were needed to work in the fields out of the field because now you had tools that could perform more efficiently than humans could. And it moved them into the cities where they then took jobs and worked on assembly lines. And as we've automated that as computers, anyway, my point with all of this is that anytime you see a transition in history, a transformation in history that is impacted by technology, you always have winners and you always have losers. And so the people that are that own these algorithms that design this stuff are, are winning and they're winning big. Um, and there is a chance of there being a negative impact. And I'll just, I'll put it like this. It is very likely in the next 10 years that cars will drive themselves. And I know this is big hype and a lot of people say it won't happen and whatever. But if it happens, what happens to the 2.7 million people that are employed as a truck driver or a taxi driver 
when they're no longer needed. So again, and, and ironically, they're training the tools that are being used to replace them. Um, so there are always winners and losers. And for the lawyers that are interested in this, I, the, the last point I wanna make on this is that when these transformations happen, the way that we govern ourselves is through law. And so the law has to change as well. So can the law keep up with the advances? Chris said, like, who is accountable? Who do we hold accountable if there's a failure? If, the, if a car accident happens because the algorithm got it wrong and somebody dies, who, who do we hold accountable? Do we hold the software company that created it? Do we hold the car manufacturer accountable? Who do we insure in that problem? Right now, we insure the driver. Right, because like you're the risk. So if you're going to get into a car, you have to have insurance and the insurance is on you and, and how good of a driver, your age, your grades, all these different factors go into turn how much you have to pay for that insurance. It actually flips when people are no longer driving the cars, right? Now the car needs to insure me against it because I'm not in control anymore. So anyway, that maybe is a little bit off topic, but no, no, really, really great points and kind of uh, touching on, on several things about how we're making, how we're making AIs make the decisions when you were talking, Nadeep, you were talking about building the models um, and, and just the implications. What are some of these implications, I, I guess, of a bias uh, within the corporate setting, uh, Chris, um, in the corporate legal setting? Oh, Sorry, I might I, just need to repeat that one more time. I lost a little bit of connection. The joys of technology, hey, that works all the time. Let's all be worried about AI. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I said, what are the uh, potential kind of biases or uh, uh, concerns for, for AI in, in the uh, corporate law practice? So it's very much aligned to, to what Ivy was talking about is, um, you know, it's only ever going to be as good as the data that you're inputting um, th to help train the system. It will take that and move that forward, though. I have to say I got drawn into a, a, a longer conversation than I wanted to um, on, uh, last night where um, we then got into a debate about that. But then you can train the AI to take the bias out of the data that it's then working on, which then my head just went. I couldn't cope with that. I just it, it was, it, it, I got completely lost um but that's the bit that we need to be aware of is is how are you using it and um, are we using it and even ethically how are we starting to use these these pieces of technology um it is learning it could do could it do a better decision is it making a better decision is it taking bias out of those decisions um that's where it's got it gets interesting but there is still that fundamental question that we need to resolve is that um if it's taking, if it's looking back and it's taking all that information and using that to go forward, um, it has to deal with the challenges and the biases that might be sat in amongst all of those things. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I guess, you know, I, I feel like sometimes we're like winding this clock up that it's going to happen and we're, we're not going to be able to turn uh, the clock back uh, so, and as we've seen this with, with the case of Google and their AI ethicists kind of called the alarm and, and you know, that, that whole deal, how can we ensure these mechanisms that uh, transparency, accountability uh, within uh, AI systems within the law? Is, is that to me? Uh, anyone could take that. Ah, sure, sure. Um, uh, well, look, I think that that's where it gets interesting for me because um, it's it that's where there's the opportunity for more work. More work will come out of this. The the advancement with law and legislation, um, we need to keep up with what is coming out of these technological advancements um, and, and get ahead of the curve on those. Because I think that's, we, we need to think about the implications. We need to start to build the legislation around it exactly as IV was talking before as to how we, we, we're able to deal with things when things go wrong. 
um, and cope with that because they will inevitably things with wrong decisions will be made um, interpretation of what the AI have, has said might be wrong finding where that blame sits or finding out you know how to correct it is is going to be absolutely key we are going to be moving in directions that we don't even know about yet we need all of this to play out before we can identify where the legal opportunities sit but they will they will be there that's the one thing that we do know there's not a move that you can't make that won't, won't tie back to some kind of legal requirement or legal control um, we We've just not written it yet. Yeah, and Miguel, I would add just one thing to that, which is I, I think oftentimes we we make a mistake by um, arguing against the technology because it's not perfect. And you know what I would say is that you know as we've invented technology, we've also invented the tragedies that go with it. You know, we invented the car, and so came the car crash. We invented the airplane and so came an airplane, you know, crash. Um, and so it's not that they're not without risk. There are risks. I think, you know, as we look at how do we mitigate the risk, how do we, what are we acceptable? You know, there's a statistic in the, in the um, self-driving car discussion that is predicted that there are a million people a year die in car crashes right now. It's predicted that when self-driving cars truly take over, that that number will be somewhere around 10,000 to 100,000. It's a dramatic decrease in the number of people that die. Like objectively, I think we all think, oh, that's awesome. But yet the first person that dies because a car, there was a software glitch. <laughs> um, people are going to think that's unacceptable and i get it i mean that, that seems horrible but yet like compared to like what we the risk we live with now so it's, it seems to me that um if we put the guardrails around what we're trying to protect and we're going to figure it out as we go and we're going to as a society decide what's acceptable what, where the risk is too high and if we can ensure against it we will and if we can legislate against it we will and but it, we can't stop it it's not gonna we're not this train is left <laughs> and I don't think we're going to stop it. Nadi? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think practically speaking, um, you know, some actions that, because you, know, you, you have control over your spaces, right? And, and some actions, you know, we can be doing at our companies are, are actually, you know, putting to paper what we, what might be a, a list of, I don't, I don't want to say regulations, but just things to consider as, as you are building out new products. Um, and, and just talking about that with the, with the respective teams that are, um, that are doing that. I think like, you know, as this, as Black Lives Matter, this, all of the movements that are taking place right now, I, I see like the emergence of a chief diversity officer that, um, I don't know how much that's, that's coming on the law side, but like, that's another thing that perhaps someone in that, that role could, could also be initiating. But it, in place of that, like we can all be taking these actions and, and, um, and just start starting the conversation would be a first step. Yeah, and I, I will say thank you. I will say the last question um, I'll, I'll throw out to you all: How, how should future lawyers in, engage with AI and with with technology? And I'll just throw that out to to the group. I'll, I'll have a little, little stab at the start. Look, I think it's really um, interesting because all of this is going to invoke a change in the way that we train our lawyers um, and what opportunities there are available to them. There are many universities now that are linking up law and computer science, which I find two worlds that you never thought would come together are now colliding um, and creating new opportunities, new ways of learning and new ways of training. Um, I think in many respects, if I think back to my own legal education, um, you know, I was frustrated because I was just learning how to do things the way that they should be done. It's the, the control F story where you want to be able to find and suggest new ways of doing things and you weren't necessarily able to before we're now starting to build out a platform where that can happen um, and innovation is happening within law firms we're bringing in people to focus on technology um, and and the two are now uniting so um, there's a lot to think about and we don't have all the answers right now but I think it is a, a journey that we're all on and there is a new generation that is coming through that are far more FA with with technology and more willing to get involved and think about how to use it you marry that up with a legal mind then I start we start to get really interesting technology
technology in the legal space that, that really does work for the powers of good. It is access to justice is where we're going to see the most significant impact in, in all of this and quite rightly show so we should be helping those people that aren't able to get the legal advice and support that they need um, to be able to either avoid challenges or deal with challenges once they've, they've, they've come through. Um, so I think going back to that question of it is going to change the way that we've got to train um, but it's creating more opportunities for our lawyers to get involved in, in different ways. Learn quicker. Um, you'll be able to, to upskill far, far, far faster, faster than, than potentially where before, but you're able to also engage with this, the work that's being done to develop some of these great ideas. Yeah, I, I would just add to that, that I think the mindset needs to shift to this kind of growth mindset. We have to shift um, how we approach the problems and look, a, you know, again, it, we use the term like AI and it's kind of scary because it, it means so many things and we don't, a lot of us don't even really know what someone means when they say AI. So I just, again, let's replace the word and just say, what are the technology tools that lawyers are gonna to use to be able to better leverage their assets so they can help more people provide greater value and, you know, ha have a successful career as a lawyer. and. So it's, it's, it's all the things that we've talked about, the young lawyers are gonna be embracing. And, and quite frankly, you know, when I was, so I graduated law school in 1998. When I entered law school in 1995, the first semester we took legal writing and we had to learn how to, to look up statutes and, and case law in books. And we got a free Lexis Nexus password and we could use that, but we had to do it in books. And the argument was, you have to know how to do it in books. And it just seemed to me like, this is weird. Like, I don't think that's how it's gonna be done in the future, right? <laughs> like we can do it at a computer, let's do it on the computer. Um, we need to have that mindset. Like, yeah, it used to be done in books, now it's done online. Pretty soon it's gonna be done for us. So we're gonna get a summary email from Navid, or Navid um, is gonna send us a summary of what all the case law we should be, be using in our brief. I would just answer that question. I, I think there's a lot of potential. I would love access to, to case law just to prove this out, but I think there's a lot of, um, I'm working on you know XYZ case. Imagine a scenario where you could search against what you're doing and see similar cases in the past and how it played out. And, and maybe I wanna click into one to understand that in greater detail and the ability to do so. Um, these are all things that are, are being done on the, on the news media, social media side. And, and there's no reason provided we have access to that data that we couldn't do this on the law side. So there's a lot of potential for really rich analysis and the ability to get to that quickly to make you a more effective attorney. So it's not for sure not re replacing your job. We need you to look at that data and understand it and, and then decide what the next steps are. But we can provide you that if, if, uh, you know, if, if I have access to that, that information. I oh, wholeheartedly agree. Um, and that's in essence what, what the Access to Justice Tech Fellows Program kind of aims to, to train this next generation uh, of, of, of justice advocates to kind of use leverage technology, uh, use AI, and what the future of the profession initiative is about. Uh, Jonathan was a, a supervisor to, to one of our, our fellows and who's now his co-founder. So he, he actually does that in, in practice. Uh, could you kind of share your thoughts about uh, uh, the future training and how, how future lawyers should engage AI, Jonathan? Yeah, I think programs like the A2J Tech Fellows are, are so valuable because if, you know, for graduates of schools like Penn, um, everyone, um, in your class, everyone in the places you're going to be working is going to be writing great briefs. Everyone's going to be working hard. Everyone's going to be um, doing good legal research. Um, but, you know, as you grow in your career, the real differentiator um, is going to be how can you solve problems in ways that your colleagues can't. Um, and right now, this is a really big opportunity to, to build skills to differentiate yourself as a lawyer um, by understanding tech, by understanding data, um, and uh, it doesn't take a lot. It really doesn't. You just, you have to be sort of a, a two or three out of a scale of, uh, of 10 of proficiency in these, these different little areas, just to know kind of what um, is possible and, and, and sort of who the experts are. And so I just, I, I think programs like the, the fellowship are just really an invaluable opportunity. Yeah. 
Well, I'll, I'll shift it to you, Jonathan. Should we do, I guess, a last takeaway? I, you know, I, I'll be honest. I thought we were ending at four, and then I checked and it was four fifty. Uh, um, no, I mean, I, I, I will. Um, I could yeah. just, if I could just jump in here, we are actually going to move to the audience Q&A portion and we're going to invite our 2LJD MBA student, Yuande Alade, to lead us uh, through that section of the programming. Yuande, are you with us? I am. Hi. Hi. Yuande. Great. Take it away. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so before I commence with the Q&A portion of today's event, I would like to confirm for everyone who is taking who is attending for CLE credit that the second CLE passcode is BOAT, B-O-A-T. So during the last hour, individuals submitted questions for our panelists to answer. So I will go through the list right now. So the first question is from Luke. As a future law student, my question to the panel is, how much will the law change to adapt to this new realm of legal technology known as AI? So I think this is the, the question, is the law itself going to change? And I think the answer is it has to change. Um, laws, laws are fluid anyway, and they change with technology. Um, so the law, the things that govern us, govern the decisions that are made, um, will most certainly have to change. I think this is an opportunity as a legal scholar to come up with the frameworks for how to process and, and um, deal with disputes or um, damage that is caused because of the AI and how to legislate to protect us or how to, you know, what legal theories will protect us um, from the use of AI. That would be my answer. Yeah, I'd, I'd completely agree. I mean, all of this is going to present us with new problems that we don't even know about yet. And we don't know the implications of those yet. So um, it's, it's a great opportunity for us to do what we do best and find the legal solutions to those problems. I would just add that, you know, because of technology, we're also a much more global um, citizenship now. And the fact that Chris is in, in England speaking to us, it's gotta be late there, Chris. Uh, <laughs> oh, we're getting there, we're getting there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Um, but, you know, the, the fact is that the technology touches doesn't live within natural boundaries of states or countries anymore. It's being used all over the world. So we really it's really an international problem, not just a local problem. Great. So the second question from Alexandra, it seems to me that AI can be helpful with many routine questions or quantitative aspects of legal practice, such as document review or evaluations. The AI is built off of experience, and thus there is a potential risk that if AI used to perform legal analysis, it will reinforce existing inequities built into legal precedent or existing problematic law. Uh, this issue is connected with Ms. Martin's points about problems in how AI is built. If firms begin to rely too heavily on AI to calculate risk, can this chill impact litigation or litigation that is principled, but not necessarily valuable to lawyers and funders in a money-based perspective, um, as AI risk calculus can sometimes be grounded in the status quo. I've spent some time doing work around doc review, so I can answer that portion of the question. Um, on, um, so our company um, built a product to, to help um, attorneys do doc review and, and the idea being um, you, uh, we it was, it was a gamified interface actually, we present you with a document, you, you know, say responsive, not responsive. The next document you review is based off of what you just um, inputted. And so the, the, the system actually gets better um, over time, you know, at the more you tag. Um, another way to do that same type of product is, um, is something I was mentioning earlier, the idea of, of cl developing classifiers. So do I have a classifier that understands what, what fraud might be, what, what cybersecurity might be. Um, and, and so uh, from those respects, I don't, I and mean, this is like, you only, you don't know what you don't know. Like I, I don't, I don't see the risks in, in, in those kinds of um, products where it's, it's a, uh, 
it's flagging to a reviewer, these are the things that you might want to review um, that might be relevant to your case. So, so on the document review side, which is probably why document review has um, you know, actually uh, become a success on the legal industry, but um, I think it's, it's uh, I probably, uh, my, my fellow colleagues here can speak to the, to the other use cases, but on the doc review side, I, I feel pretty safe of not introducing biases on that side. I, I would actually take, I think that's everything you said is right. And I, I think I would take just slightly different angle on this, which is to say that one of the frictions in the delivery of law is transparency. Like the problem with hiring a lawyer, and let's take an example like somebody who's getting divorced. You hire a lawyer to represent you in the divorce. You don't have transparency into how much money that's going to cost or what the outcome is going to be. There's a company, and I'm forgetting the name of it now, is in Toronto. It actually went out of business, but they took 58,000 divorce um, judgments and they ran predictive analysis on it and they put in certain factors and they could tell you what the likely outcome of your divorce would be financially. And so you would put in things like your income and your, the husband and wife's income and like you'd answer a bunch of questions and it would say, you're likely to get $50,000 in alimony if you get divorced, you're also likely to spend $75,000 to get that $50,000. Now I always joke, like if, if divorce were um, rational, you would make the rational decision just to settle it for $50,000, get rid of the lawyers and be done. Right? But we all know divorce is not rational. So, um, <laughs> but, and that's an example of where the current system we have fails because we don't have transparency where tools like this could take existing data and, and provide us a better predictive outcome of what we are likely to expect so that we can make informed decisions. Um, and then the last point on that is that all of those decisions are biased based on previous experience of litigants that have come into that court to get divorced. And so we bring all of that experience of the bias with us. We have the same problem as humans that, that you know, we will also have with AI. Thanks. And then we have a question from Joseph, touching upon some concerns around how technology may um, advantage individuals with higher uh, level skills versus lower level skills. Given the potential for this to shrink the profession, how should um, we think about training a smaller number of new lawyers in this world? Well, I can touch it. Um, I think we need to train lawyers with, with these skills to embrace technology, to embrace AI, infuse it within our curriculum, um, whether that be a first year curriculum of how AI is uh, using contracts, it is used within uh, contract uh, extraction and analysis tools, um, and also uh, providing uh, students with the practical skills in terms of whether it be developing and building out models. Um, and, and yeah, kind of touching back uh, to, to Chris's and Ivy's point about training up problem solvers um, to, to address. I think that's where legal education can, can make a drastic shift uh, to be more responsive as, as we kind of continue with this uh, changing landscape due to digital transformation. If I could add one piece to that, Miguel, I, I would say that um, there's a flaw in the question, I think, in that it seems to suggest that the need for lawyers is going away. And what I would, what I would um, offer back is that the legal market is an inefficient market and it actually doesn't work. Like if you look at it of the number of lawyers that we have and the number of people that have legal needs and that they don't always intersect. So we end up with a bunch of lawyers on the sideline and a bunch of consumers on the sidelines and we have a market, like to put it in economic terms, that where the supply and demand don't intersect. So the only way to solve that problem is to rethink how we charge for legal services. So if we can unbundle legal services and we can provide transparency and some flat fee arrangements or alternative um, billing, things like that, we can offer value in discrete, tangible, segmented pieces of 
the legal issue. I can draft your documents. I can review your documents. I can show up for you in court. This is the cost of it. It's predictable, it's transparent, and there's a known outcome to it. That shift doesn't mean we need less lawyers. It means we need lawyers that have tools where they can leverage those assets such that they can make a meaningful living by serving the needs where price is changed, but the the number of um, the, the amount of output goes up, even if the price goes down, I can actually make more money doing that. And and so like that shift in mindset may actually help solve that problem. So that concludes the Q and A portion of today's talk. I will hand it off to Jennifer for closing remarks. Thank you so much, Yawande, um, and really interesting conversation. Ivy, it was really the perfect note to, to end on because our mission through the Future of the Profession Initiative is really to think about all of these disconnects and all of the people, small businesses, organizations that aren't currently served by the legal system and the many ways that we can work to change that. And technology is one piece of that puzzle. Uh, regulatory reform is another huge piece uh, that we focus on. And then thinking in new ways about how we help our law students and our future lawyers and our current lawyers who need to evolve their understanding. You talked about growth mindset, being open and having a mindset toward evolving the way that we're understanding what we're doing and thinking about it from the user perspective and how we can make it better. So thank you. That's a perfect note to end on. Uh, I want to thank all of our panelists today. We wish you were here with us in Philadelphia in some ways so that we could uh, join you afterward and, and debrief a little bit about the experience, but we're also happy to have a more global reach in the way that we can have these conversations. And you all have answered a couple of questions definitively. The technology is here. It's here to stay. We need to work to figure out what that looks like in a legal space and combat the biases um, and think about the ethical issues really carefully as we deploy it. But you've also raised a lot of questions that we certainly won't answer today, but we can have some time together to talk about for those who are interested in joining us uh, for our post webinar conversation, which will begin at 430 Eastern Standard Time. Uh, you should have seen a link in the chat if you'd like to join that conversation and you'll also receive uh, a link in your email. Um, so with that, I want to thank our panelists, but I really want to thank um, the team that worked behind the scenes to bring this great conversation to life, especially Naoshi Giles from Penn Law's events, uh, conferences and events team, Galila Lewis from the Future of the Profession Initiative, and our partners in ITS. Um, we hope you all will help us improve our programming by sharing your feedback. The survey is linked in the chat for you to do that. Next week, we'll return with the next session in our spring series, uh, also Wednesday from 3 to 4.15 Eastern Standard Time. And at that time, we'll explore the future of racial equity in the profession. You can learn more and register at futureofthelegalprofession.org. Uh, for right now, we are going to take a quick break. Uh, but again, we hope to see many of you at 4.30 Eastern Standard Time. For those of you who aren't able to join us, we thank you for your attendance today and we look forward to seeing more of you in the future. In the meantime, be well and stay safe.